everyone hear me okay? Great. So the last few years, the networking community has been embarking on a major rethinking of the relationship between the network switches and the people and systems that manage them. And in particular, there's a move towards greater programmability. So just uh, Scott gave a really nice talk yesterday, I think, giving a nice overview of why this trend is happening, why it's taking off now, and the promise that it has for helping us develop greater abstractions for reasoning about the network. And so what I'm going to talk about today is some work I've been doing at Princeton with programming languages colleagues at both Princeton and Cornell, looking at ways to raise the level of abstraction for programming the network. So in particular, uh, APIs like OpenFlow and software-defined networking in general make it possible to program the network, but it doesn't make it easy. And so what we're going to talk about today are ways to make it much easier to do. And the language that we're developing uh, is called Phonetic. So just to give a quick overview of software-defined networking building on the talk Scott gave yesterday, in a software-defined network, you have a logically centralized controller that can run arbitrary programs that manages a distributed collection of switches by responding to events that happen on those switches and installing rules that dictate the packet handling functionality on those switches. And then OpenFlow is a good example of such an API. So what's interesting in this model is you've got, at the top, a smart but relatively slow controller that can run arbitrary software. And in the switches, you have things that are pretty dumb but extremely fast. And so one of the major challenges here is to figure out how to present to the programmer an appealing abstraction of writing one program that runs in one place with network-wide visibility, when in practice that work needs to be partitioned between a small number of operations that happen on the uh, smart but slow controller and the vast majority of operations happening in the, in the dumb but fast switches. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in Frenetic. So part of the challenge of programming these kinds of networks uh, one thing that does help a lot is you have, first of all, a very simple abstraction of the data plane, and I'll elaborate on that in a little more detail in a moment. You have a centralized architecture, which makes it easier to reason about network-wide visibility and network-wide control. And you have direct control over the underlying switches, rather than sort of indirect Baroque mechanisms that today's control planes offer. So that's good. Uh, unfortunately, the interface that OpenFlow provides is extremely low level. It's just a very thin veneer on the capabilities of the underlying hardware. That's not a bad thing, but it's not the interface we necessarily want the programmer to program to, because the functionality ends up being very tied to the hardware and very tied to very specific kind of bid and packet header level manipulations that one wants to do. And you also have to manage control over the resources. These switches have a relatively small amount of space for storing the rules that are going to process the packets. And this forces the programmer to reason about the sizes of those tables, the amount of information they can hold, much like doing register allocation if you're writing uh, assembly language code. Um, so, and then finally, the ugly is that in practice, we often want to write multiple program modules that do different things, routing, access control, network monitoring, server load balancing. We want to be able to write those as separate modules and compose them together. And yet in practice, they're sharing a single set of rules in the underlying switches. And so we force the programmer today in, in, network, in networking technologies like OpenFlow to reason about how to compose their programs together. If we had a higher level language, we could do that much better. And that's exactly what we're trying to do, is to add on top of the logically centralized controller programming language abstractions that will make it easier for people to write programs on top. And if we pick those uh, abstractions well, we can run a, write a whole bunch of different modules for doing anything from topology discovery to routing and access control in a modular way and make these programs portable across switches from different vendors with different capabilities and resources. And so that's essentially the, the vision we have in the Frenetic project. So, so how do we approach doing that? Well, before I go to that, I want to just give you a really quick overview of OpenFlow just to kind of set the stage for what we're building on top of. So OpenFlow is a, an API that's developed by folks at Stanford that provides a, an ability to interact directly with the underlying switch hardware in a, in a programmatic way. And the basic abstraction is that you have a prioritized list of rules where each rule has a pattern that indicates which packets match that rule. And it matches on a subset of bits in the, in the packet headers, MAC addresses, IP addresses, port numbers, and so on, and a collection of actions, drop the packet, forward it out a particular interface, flood, go to the controller, and so on. And then a priority to disambiguate rules that are overlapping. So an OpenFlow switch could act like an IP router if the rules match only on a prefix of the destination IP address prioritized by their length. It could be an Ethernet switch if it matches on MAC addresses. It could be a firewall if it matches on the five tuple and simply drops or forwards the packets. It could be a network address translator if it rewrites the packets. So the really nice thing about OpenFlow is it unifies all these different marketing terms we use to talk about different kinds of devices in the network into one simple API. And all of these different kinds of network functionality that we think of as so fundamental end up just being differences in how you choose to program to that interface. In addition, the, the, there are usually a series of counters associated with each rule that give you the number of bytes and the number of packets uh, that match that particular rule. So an OpenFlow switch, then, is just a simple box that takes packets in, finds the highest priority matching rule, 
applies the actions associated with that rule and increments the counters. Newer versions of OpenFlow do this on a wider range of header fields with a wider range of actions and even support things like multiple levels of tables in a pipeline. But the simple basic model will take you through the rest of the talk if you're not already familiar with the newer versions of OpenFlow. So the API to OpenFlow just allows you primarily to install rules of this type and to query the counters associated with these rules and to uninstall the rules and to see events happening from the underlying network. And so most of the higher level action is taking place on the controller, which you could think of as running a sort of network operating system. And I think the design of this network operating system is still a very active and vibrant area of research that's going on now. So what does this network OS do? What well, processes events that come in from the network? Topology changes like switches going up or down or links going up or down. Statistics arriving from the network and even occasional packets that have an action that says forward this packet to the controller because the switch doesn't know what to do. And in response, an event handler that runs in the application will usually affect some sort of change in the network like adding or removing rules, reading the counters, uh, even sending a packet that previously was sent to the controller. And so a big question here is what should the abstractions on this controller be to be able to write programs that control OpenFlow networks effectively? And that's exactly the space that we're in. So what I want to do next is just give you two examples of applications running on OpenFlow. People at a lot of different places have developed a lot of interesting applications, anywhere from energy efficient networking to uh, seamless mobility and so on. I'm just going to give you two examples, mainly to illustrate how the API works. And also, I'll come back to these examples later as, uh, when I talk more about Frenetic. So a very simple example that we've developed at Princeton is a server load balancer. Here we just have two servers offering the same service with the same IP address. Today, if you're running a load balancer, you'd buy a dedicated box and install it in your network. It would be expensive. It would be a single point of failure and a single point of attack. In this setting, you could imagine a collection of OpenFlow switches acting as that load balancer by having rules installed in them that split the traffic, going to the same destination to the different, uh, different instances of that service. So here, for example, based on the client IP address, I'm saying half the clients, the ones whose address start with zero, go to one of the two server replicas, and the other half that start with one go to the other. So by simply installing those rules in the network, I can now partition the traffic between the two server replicas and essentially obviate the need to have a separate load balancer. So in this case, the controller's not doing very much at all. When the switches come up, it's installing these rules in the network, and unless something fails, uh, there's not really anything else to do. So this is a very much a proactive application that no packets would go to the controller. A uh, second example, if you look at, at supporting mobility or migration, here think VM migration in a data center or device mobility in an enterprise. And here I'm showing it as device mobility where this iPhone is going to move. So let's suppose these two hosts have been communicating for a while, and the, one of these hosts moves to a new location. The traffic is going to the wrong location now because the host has moved. But if the switch at the new location has a default rule that says, hey, I don't know where, what packets from this source are supposed to be handled, it'll send that packet to the controller. And in, the, in response, the controller will learn where this host is located now and can install new rules in the switches that direct the traffic to the host's new location. So without any, either of the two hosts of the network knowing, the routes in the network have followed the host to its new location just by sending a single event to the controller and having the controller respond by installing updated rules in the new path and removing the old rules in the old path. Okay. So those are just two very simple examples of applications you can run on top of OpenFlow. So how can you build better abstractions for writing these applications? Today, when you write one of these applications, you essentially write a collection of event handlers that respond to these topology change, packets, and so on, come into the controller and then install new rules. So I want to walk through three different things that make programming these networks hard and then walk through three different abstractions we developed in Frenetic for doing that. And so one way to view this is a, is a sort of control loop, where when you manage a network, you essentially measure what's going on in the network, which is a form of reading of network state. You do some sort of policy computation to decide how you're going to adapt the way the network is behaving based on this new information. And you may have multiple policies for different aspects of your network. And so those may need to be composed together. And so that's the second thing we're going to do is compose policy. And finally, you want to be able to write policy into the network and even though it's a distributed collection of switches, you'd like to view this as taking place in one fell swoop, where the entire network is now running uh, the new policy. And so we're going to look at each of these three problems in turn, and why they're hard, and what abstractions might make them easier. So I'm going to start with reading of network state. And so one form of reading of network state is looking at the traffic counters. Right? So these rules in OpenFlow have byte and packet counters, and they can tell you quite a bit about what's going on in the network. But one difficulty there is if you want to understand that traffic, you may have to have more than one rule to represent all the traffic you want to, want to measure. So a good example I show here is let's suppose you want to look at web server traffic, except traffic uh, for a particular source IP address. 
So to be able to do that simple expression of saying, I want to look at all port 80 traffic except the traffic coming from source 1.2.3.4, you might have to install two rules and use priorities to disambiguate between them so that you have one counter that's counting the traffic that does have that source IP address and all other traffic falling through to the second rule so that the remaining traffic has a separate counter associated with it. And this can get progressively more complicated as you want to slice and dice the traffic in more complex ways. So a very simple thing that we do, it's not particularly deep, but it helps in making programming easier, is to allow the programmer to write these kinds of queries with predicates. To say, you know, using simple Boolean logic, which traffic they want to be able to collect statistics for. And later in the runtime system, underneath the program the user writes, we'll be able to translate that into a list, prioritized list of rules that accurately represent that predicate. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing we do is, in fact, in practice, we often have a limited number of rules that we can store on the switch. And, and sometimes you want to be able to actually ask something of the network, like, I want to have a histogram of traffic by IP address. This is tricky because there are two to the 32 potential IP addresses, although in practice you'll see a very small fraction of them. So it's not really reasonable ahead of time to install rules for all the IP addresses you might reasonably see, just in the hope that you'll have a counter there when you need it. So in practice, you want to be able to have a rule, let's say if there has been a packet from host 1.2.3.4, there should be a rule there. And then whenever you see a packet from a new source IP address, you'd like to reactively install a new rule to have a counter associated with that traffic. This is a big burden on the programmer. They have to essentially subscribe to these kinds of events from the network, reactively install rules. Instead, we allow the programmer to just say, I want to collect something by grouped by source IP address, and the runtime system will automatically dynamically unfold uh, the rules as necessary to install rules for each IP address that manifests itself and time out the rules that are no longer needed when a particular host is no longer active. So the programmer just says, hey, I want traffic grouped by IP address. The runtime system takes care of the rest. A third example is a, is a very common programming idiom in OpenFlow and one that's extremely error prone, which is the idea of sending the first packet of a group of traffic to the controller. We saw this example in the dynamic unfolding I just described a moment ago. We saw it in the mobility example a few slides ago. So the idea here is by default, when you don't know what to do with a packet, you send it to the controller. And the controller in response is going to set up some sort of rule in the network to handle this packet and other packets that look like it. Unfortunately, there is delay between the switches and the controller. And so in practice, it's possible that while the rule is being installed, triggered by the first packet, a second packet of this group goes to the controller as well. That may be fine, but now the programmer can't just fire and forget. He has to remember the action he's taking for the first packet to make sure the arrival of the second packet doesn't lead to any kind of inconsistency. Uh, and also, it, just, it requires a lot of extra bookkeeping. So in practice, what we'd prefer to do is actually hide that detail from the programmer. So if the programmer can just say, hey, I only want to see one such packet, and let the runtime system take care of whatever race conditions might arise. So if the second packet in this example goes to the controller, the controller can hide that detail from the application and handle that packet the way the programmer has already said he wants packets like that handled. The switch may not have known yet what to do, but the runtime system of the controller does. And so it can suppress that information from the application and take the action associated with those rules without the programmer having to see that detail. Now, just to digress on this for a moment, we did a, a study at NSDI this year of doing model checking to a bunch of different OpenFlow applications that people have written on top of the Knox operating system and trying to find programming errors. And in fact, this error was made over and over and over again. It's a very easy and very, I mean, very easy novice mistake to make to assume that you have central and instantaneous control over the network and wrongly expect that other packets you don't think you're going to see uh, will come to the controller. In fact, I have a paper of my own that had a bug uh, in my master's student's thesis uh, exactly like this. And I was teasing him the other day that it's a, it's a good thing for him the ink is already dry in his diploma. Because uh, his, there were actually, in fact, we found several bugs in his code. It's not at all uncommon to make these sort of subtle mistakes that might only manifest themselves in corner cases where the timing uh, of packets or the timing of the delays between the switch and the controller end up being different than you expect. So putting all these things together, what we've put together is essentially a very simple SQL-like query model that allows the programmer to say what events or statistics uh, the programmer needs to see from the network. And the key thing is we'd have them tell us exactly what they want to see, nothing more, nothing less. Whatever they ask for is what they'll see, and they won't see extra stuff they didn't ask for. We used SQL because, frankly, it's just a simple and very appealing abstraction. People already know about it. And it, in our case, what it does is it returns a stream of statistics or events that correspond to the things the user's asking about. The other reason we use SQL is the terms in the SQL query will help give the programmer a sense of the overhead of what kind of things he's asking the network to do. And I'll give a couple examples of that. 
And in particular, we have constructs in the SQL-like language that we have that allow uh, the things that the user writes to be translated very naturally into things open flow switches can naturally do. So just to give two examples, imagine I want to collect traffic statistics uh, arriving from the internet on input port two with uh, TCP port number 80. So think of this as traffic from web servers to internal clients. Here I can say I just want to see the number of bytes just for this particular subset of traffic using this predicate grouped by destination MAC address. I want to know who in my network is receiving all of these packets, and I want to see that every 60 seconds. By doing that, the runtime system will take care of letting the programmer say this just once, and under the hood, it's going to apply that predicate to create rules, dynamically unfold as new destination MAC addresses appear, and do the essential callbacks to be able every 60 seconds to pull all the counters, sum their results, and return a single stream of byte counts uh, back to the programmer, hiding all the asynchronous details from the programmer. Here's a second example that corresponds to the mobility example I had earlier, where the programmer says, well, I want to see packets in this case, not just counters of the number of bytes, but the actual packets themselves, every time a source MAC address arrives on a new input port to learn that this host has moved to a, a new location. Then I would say, OK, I want to see packets. I want to see them every time there's a new MAC address, split every time that MAC address has a new input port. And I only want to see one such packet. That's exactly what a learning switch, or in this mobility case, uh, something doing mobility needs to see. And the programmer, again, doesn't have to deal with the unfolding of these rules, and will always know that it sees just one packet, uh, even if more than one happens to find its way to the controller. Okay. So that's the first part of Frenetic, is providing this, this query language that will allow the programmer to outsource to the underlying runtime system the details of getting the statistics they need. And as we'll see in a moment, we'll make sure that these queries always work, even if there are other things going on in the network, like other queries from other program modules that might want to see a different subset of traffic or a different subset of events and also compose with it whatever policies might also be installing rules to be able to take forwarding actions on the packets. So that, that really leads to the need for some form of composition, which is the next thing uh, that we have in Frenetic. So now the programmer knows what's going on in the network and wants to be able to affect change in the underlying behavior of the network. This could be computing new paths when a link fails or links are congested. This could be traffic monitoring of the type we just talked about a moment ago. This could be access control policy, server load balancing, and so on. And all these different modules may need to run at the same time. Something is dealing with connectivity, something is dealing with measurement, something is dealing with security, will coexist at the same time rather than being an independent program. So the problem is, in the end, all of these are sharing the exact same state in the switch. Not unlike needing to share registers when you're, when you're doing programming in assembly language. And so we would like, the, ideally, to be able to write these things separately and let the runtime system take care of arbitrating the use of the, the shared resource in the network, and in particular to make sure if a single packet needs to be handled by more than one of these modules, that the underlying rules in the switches reflect that correctly. And that's the, that's the thing that OpenFlow doesn't do because it essentially is just a thin veneer on the hardware for installing and uninstalling these rules. So just to illustrate that, I'm going to take two very simple programs, a repeater which is the simplest form of routing you can imagine. Packets that come in one interface, go out the other, and vice versa. And a simple monitor, similar to the type we were talking about earlier, that's just doing traffic counting. Uh, so here's the repeater. It's written in sort of a Knox-like Perl style. Whenever a switch joins the network, this event handler runs, and it just installs two rules. Each one has a pattern that says, OK, the pattern is if traffic's arriving on input port one, then the associated action should be to forward the packets out on output port two. And the second does the opposite, except it has a typo. It should be actually anything coming in on input port two should go out on output port one. Yeah, that's it. So no packets going to the controller, just two rules, one forwarding traffic in each direction. The second program does simple monitoring of port 80 traffic. And I've written this again in this sort of stylized knock style that says, hey, for all traffic coming in on input port two that has source port of 80, web traffic, install a rule that has no actions, because I just want the counters. And I'm going to query it using this event handler every every uh, 30 seconds to be able to get those stats. So relatively simple program. No packets again go to the controller. I'm just going to install one rule and periodically query it for its counters. Now imagine I want to do both of these two things. You would think it's as simple as saying do A and B, but in practice, this is what you get. A handwritten program that interleaves the behavior of the two I just described. So what's in black here is borrowed from the repeater program. What's in red is borrowed from the monitoring program. And what's in white is from neither. It's something that exists just to disambiguate the behavior of the two programs. So just to, to kind of go through that, I've got three rules, one matching input traffic, sending it out, and two matching incoming traffic from the external internet, one matching just on web traffic, because I want the counters for that traffic, and another falling through to match on everything else to make sure that the forwarding is done correctly. So this middle rule that has all three colors is matching web traffic, 
It has to have a high priority to make sure it gets precedence over the remaining rule that matches the rest of the traffic. And it has to forward the traffic out output port one to have the effect of a repeater. So it's simultaneously doing monitoring, repeating, and using high priority to indicate that this monitoring rule should get precedence over the rest of the traffic being forwarded. Now, in this simple example, this is already pretty complicated. You could imagine that this could get quite a bit more complicated if the two programs you're composing are more complex or if you're composing more than two modules. Now, in practice, we really do need these three rules, so there's no free lunch here. The key is to find a way for the runtime system to do this rather than the programmer, and that's, that's exactly what we've done. So, so how do we do that? Well, so in way, the way this would look in Frenetic is you would write a simple repeater that looks not very different than the program I showed you before. You would write a simple monitor using our SQL-like query language, and then you would just say do both. So from the programmer's point of view, these two modules can be written separately. They can be written by different people. They, one could be software you've bought from someone else, and one could be locally written software, and you can just compose them together. So the action here is not that, not that, because that's, that's actually just the goal. We want to be able to write programs like this. The key question is how do we do it? So in our initial runtime system, we took a very simple approach to doing this, and I'll describe the more sophisticated approach in the next slide. So essentially what we do in Frenetic is the Frenetic program runs on top of a runtime system that takes care of interacting with a lower level operating system like Knox. And what the Frenetic program does is subscribe to queries using our SQL-like query language, and also register policies, register sets of rules they want, the module wants installed in the network. The runtime system will take care of translating that into the low-level rules that need to be installed and uninstalled in the network, and make sure that each module running on top sees exactly what it needs to see and nothing more. So our initial implementation of this was, was reactive and microflow-based. So what I mean by that is every UDP or TCP flow had the first packet of that flow go to the controller. Very similar to a lot of applications written in the, in the beginning in the early days of OpenFlow. This is clearly inefficient. For some of the examples I described a moment ago that didn't need to send packets to the controller, our initial implementation would. So this is not the end state we want to get to. This is just an easy way to describe a way of, of implementing a runtime system that works correctly. So when the first packet comes to the controller, we'll figure out how to handle that packet, and if possible, we'll install rules to handle all the rest of the packets that look like this one. So what do we do? We look at all the policies that are registered by all the modules and accumulate all the actions that those policies would do. And if, it's, if in fact, no queries care about this data, no queries need to see other packets than this one, then we can install that rule that we've just generated in the previous step and not have any of the remaining packets of this flow go to the controller. And that's essentially the implementation. Good thing is we can reason about correctness because we know we're doing all the appropriate actions and we know that we can afford whenever no queries care about a packet of a particular type, we know we can safely outsource to the network the handling of all the remaining packets using the same set of actions. Now, the more interesting runtime system, which was developed by my collaborators at, uh, at Princeton and, and Cornell, was published at Popple this year. Uh, it's a really, really nice paper. I, I can't do it justice here, but just to give you a hint of how it works, it essentially does the same operation I described manually earlier. We have two different kind of programs, one that's doing the repeater, the first thing, that's forwarding on patterns like input port one, input port two, and we have this monitoring predicate that's looking at logic like looking at traffic coming in on input port two with TCP port number 80. And essentially what we're gonna do is a cross product of the, of the predicates on the left with the predicates on the right and generate all combinations that are non-trivial and that's, that's the result we have after the equal sign. So the only interesting ones that are here are input port one, input port two is source port 80, and input port two in that order. And that becomes a set of rules that get generated by the runtime system to correctly mimic the behavior of both of these two modules. Now, this is still a little bit challenging because each of these predicates may themselves be, have to be represented by more than one rule. In this example, they don't. They're relatively simple, but in more general cases, they could. So each of these predicates would then get unrolled into a prioritized list of rules just for that one predicate. And we may, in fact, also have to dynamically install rules as packets arrive, particularly when we have you know, things that are grouping by IP address, things that are much more complicated than what I show here. But essentially what's going on in the runtime system then is this cross product operation and then optimizations of the resulting list to, to send the rules to the controller, uh, rules to the switches. Okay, so that's the second case, is being able to do composition. So now the programmer can query the network for the information that he needs to see, can write multiple modules and compose them without having to modify the code to make it work. And then finally the third thing is how to actually affect changes to the network. So, one of the main challenges in networking is whenever you make change to the network, you have transient disruptions. There's a classic problem, comes up in firewall configuration and routing protocols and a variety of other settings, that whenever you transition the network from one set of policies to another, you have a transient period of time where packets in flight may experience something you don't want. 
So why are you changing the network? Well, you might be changing network for very mundane reasons like maintenance. You might be changing, uh, you might be responding to a failure, you might be updating your access control policy, you might be doing traffic engineering. For any of these reasons, you want to be able to change the set of rules and one or more switches in the network. And you would likely, ideally like, during the transition, not to have things like forwarding loops, black holes, access control violations, or other properties that you care about, like all traffic should go through a particular middle box. You don't want those to be violated. So we've got a bunch of things causing change and a bunch of invariants we'd like to, to not, have, not be violated uh, during the change. Now, in the networking community over the past decade, there have been paper after paper solving this problem for particular cases of invariants and particular kinds of changes and for firewalls for each of the different routing protocols we have. But this is a perfect example of what Scott was getting at yesterday, that we can have general abstractions now because we've got a single model of the data plane. We can have one, one way of handling, consistently updating the state of the network that can apply across a wide variety of different reasons you're changing the network and different invariants that you want to hold while you do. So just to go through uh, that in a little more detail, what do we do? Well, I'll give you one example uh, using shortest path routing policy. So here, we are routing based on shortest paths and the controller is essentially picking what those shortest paths would be based on some sort of, let's say, link weights. And it's forwarding all the traffic on the upper path. Now, let's suppose for whatever reason one of these links is congested, we might decide we want to make this link a little heavier so that traffic is, is deflected away from it. That would lead to a change in the network where the traffic actually goes to the lower path. But during the transition, depending on what order you update these two switches in the middle, you might have one switch forwarding to the other, which in turn is forwarding back. Classic example of a loop. This can easily happen during uh, convergence of OSPF, for example. Now with centralized controller, we can decide what order in which we update these switches so that that doesn't happen. But that's extremely tedious for the programmer. And in fact, in many cases, finding an exact ordering for doing that is actually not only computationally difficult, but sometimes not even feasible. So we want to take all of that out of the hands of the programmer. And so the way we do that, um, that I'll describe in a moment, is to provide a, a single API for just saying, change my network from this policy to that policy. Just to give a second example, this is another very common bug in OpenFlow programs, is to assume that when you install rules from the controller on multiple switches that it happens at the same time across all the switches. So imagine you've got a program that is sending a packet to the controller, and then the controller is installing rules to set up a path. If the rule at the first switch gets installed uh, before the rules at the second and third switch commit, it's possible the packet in flight will hit the second switch before the rules have gotten there. In the, in the simplest case, this packet might go to the controller and the programmer would have to remember, oh, a packet like this, I've already decided how I want to handle it, and send it back. That's already a burden. Worse yet, that packet might match something else that's sitting on the switch that's of lower priority because the, the rule that should be above it hasn't arrived yet, in which case the packet will be handled incorrectly, uh, different than what the programmer intended. These kind of bugs are extremely subtle and very easy to, to get wrong and hard to detect because, again, they depend on subtle differences in the timing and ordering of packets and the timing and ordering of messages going to different switches, all of which in a best effort network can manifest in a lot of very interesting and complex ways. So that's a second example where the programmer could easily get this wrong. So, so what do we do? Well, we, rather than have the programmer have to think about all this, we'll have a simple abstraction that just says, I want to transition my entire network from policy one to policy two. And so we define a couple of different definitions of what a consistent policy would look like for doing that. So one is per packet consistency, which as the name suggests, implies that any individual packet in the network at the time of the update is either processed entirely by policy P1 or entirely by policy P2. Never some weird mixture of the two. Never having one of the switches in the network still applying policy P1 while the rest are applying policy P2. Okay, this is very useful for a lot of applications like access control reconfiguration, avoiding loops and black holes, and so on. But it's not enough. In some cases, for example, server load balancing, you might want all the packets of a single flow, like all the packets of a TCP connection, to go to the same replica of a web server, even if a change in load balancing policy is in the midst of happening. So in this case, we have a set of related packets that we want to be processed entirely by P1 or entirely by P2, and not, again, not a mixture of the two. So those are the two abstractions we want to provide, per packet updates and per flow updates. So you might be thinking that the natural thing to do is, a, is an atomic update. But an atomic update itself is not enough either because we have to worry about these packets in flight. We have to make sure a packet in flight doesn't experience life before or after the change. So essentially what we're going to do is equivalent of a two-phase commit or some optimizations that allow us to avoid that in common cases. So the abstraction the programmer has is that they just say, this is the particular update abstraction I want. I want per packet updates, and here's my new policy. The runtime system will take care of analyzing the old policy and the new one, 
and figure out the right way to do an update so that the properties, uh, all the properties of P1 and P2 have in common will be obeyed. So one thing I should state here that's actually very nice about this is if you have this consistent update semantics, the programmer gets something nice. Not only does the programmer not have to worry about how to do the update, but if there's some property the programmer cares about, they can verify it directly on P1 and on P2 and know for certain it holds during the transition. Rather than having to verify that policy on all possible interleavings of updates that might happen between P1 and P2. So for example, if you care about not having uh, loops, you just verify P1 doesn't have loops and P2 doesn't have loops and you know no packets will get stuck in loops. The nice thing too is that the programmer doesn't have to tell the runtime system which property uh, he cares about because all properties that hold for both P1 and P2 inherently hold during the transition because all packets during the transition follow one or, two, one or the other of those policies in their entirety. So if, essentially that, that reduces the burden. The programmer doesn't have to tell us he cares about loop freedom or no black holes or anything else. And if they do care to verify that, they know they only have to verify it on the old and the new policy and nothing during the transition. And so finally, the runtime system takes care of all the heavy lifting of making sure there's a schedule of updates to the network that'll ensure that P1 and P2 are, are, are per packet consistent update. And the nice thing is, and this is another gift from OpenFlow, is OpenFlow provides us a lot of nice mechanisms for doing this. The central controller gives us a single place from which to orchestrate the network to be able to decide which switches to get updated in what order. And we have additional mechanisms we can use, like VLAN tagging or MPLS tagging, that we can use to assign version numbers to packets which is something a lot of the existing solutions couldn't do. So roughly how this works is first we use a VLAN tag or an MPLS tag to be able to stamp as a packet enters the network a version number. So essentially indicating whether it's policy P1 or policy P2 or P3 or so on that's being applied to this packet. We do that as a packet enters the network and then throughout its journey it will only match rules that have in its pattern that particular stamp. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing we're gonna do is when we're getting ready to apply update number two for policy P2, we first update the inside of the network with what we call unobservable updates. These are gonna be rules that match on the tag P2, but no packets are being tagged with P2 yet. They're all still being tagged with P1. So these rules are not gonna match anything. So we can safely apply all of those updates concurrently and wait for them all to complete. Once they've all completed, now we can safely go around the perimeter of the network and, and change how we stamp packets that are entering the network. Since each packet enters the network just once, it doesn't matter that we can do these updates asynchronously around the perimeter of the network. And now all packets are gradually being uh, applied a new version number, matching the rules we previously installed in the interior of the network. Finally, after packets in flight have had time to clear the network, based on let's say the maximum queue depth times the propagation delay through the network, we can essentially know that it's safe to remove all the rules throughout the network that relate to policy P1 so that we're not wasting space storing rules for old policies. So that's essentially what we do. Stamp packets as they come in, apply the interior part of the new policy, apply the exterior part of the new policy, delete the old policy. A two-phase commit, but implement it all using OpenFlow messages. So that's the basic idea. Now, of course, a two-phase commit can be expensive. In the worst case, we might be applying twice as many rules to the switches as necessary. So nice thing is, first of all, often when you're making a change in policy, you're not making a wholesale change in the way all packets are handled at all switches. So we can essentially narrow the scope of this two-phase commit to just the parts of the network that change and just the portions of flow space, the header fields, that are actually changing. So for example, in this picture here, these two switches might be the only ones that change, and we can redefine what the perimeter of that little subgraph of the network is and apply our two-phase commit there. Also, many policies often add or remove rules for a particular portion of traffic that were not previously handled. For those, we can do much simpler policies like just updating everything but the first switch, and only after that's done, updating the, uh, the internal switch. And so we do that as well. So the runtime system under the hood is applying all these optimizations. It's doing a delta between policy P1 and P2, figuring out which of these optimizations, if any, are safe to apply, and then doing all the steps of the update. And what the programmer sees is just a smooth transition from P1 to P2 without having to worry about it. Now, I'm not gonna go through the details of the per flow consistent update. It's much more technically involved, but fortunately, it too can be done using just open flow mechanisms. So again, without any changes to the switches, we can offer the programmer a per flow consistent update without them having to worry about the gory details. All the low-level bookkeeping is done just once by us, and as long as we've implemented it correctly, we're golden. So just to kind of summarize then, what we've got are three different abstractions. An SQL-like query language for asking the network what's going on, a way to do policy composition 
so that multiple independent modules can be composed. And then finally, a way to do consistent updates once those policies have uh, affected a change in the network. We've got essentially pieces for each of the three parts of the control loop. Uh, just a little bit of related work. Uh, this is drawn quite heavily on a, a very interesting body of work from the programming languages community called Functional Reactive Programming, FRP, and a related project, particularly in the open flow area, is the Nettle work by Paul Hudak's group at Yale. But there are a number of systems that we borrow mechanisms from, not only in the FRP community, but also in the uh, streaming uh, processing literature, and in particular Gigascope, which is a project at AT&T on doing uh, queries of packet streams running in the network. Obviously, a lot of work on OpenFlow, including by folks in this room, different languages, different controller platforms, and, and uh, different tools for, for testing uh, and debugging OpenFlow software. And of course, all the work that's going on in the Open Networking Foundation uh, plays a big role here as well. So finally, just to conclude, I think playing off of the uh, talk Scott gave yesterday, software-defined networking is really exciting. It's enabling innovation in networking. It's enabling a broad rethinking of how we write network software. Uh, and I think it's starting to happen. We see a lot of commercial switches supporting OpenFlow. We see operational networks like Google's and a number of university campuses and research backbone networks supporting OpenFlow. And we're starting to see a, a rich community of work on abstractions for network software, like the kinds that Scott talked about, the work we're doing, the work Nick Feimster and folks at Yale are doing, and so on, that are gradually uh, adding to the set of abstractions we can use to build really interesting applications that are hopefully more likely to be correct and concise and compact than the ones we have today. And I would just like to stress for those of you who's not already tuned in to what's going on in the software-defined networking community, it's a really great space to be in for being able to do research work that is extremely practically grounded. There are real deployments of this stuff, as well as something that can have a lot of rigor to it because of the, the nice general abstractions that are, that are already in place. So I think I'll stop there. These are my frenetic collaborators, a joint project between programming languages folks and distributed systems folks like Mike Friedman at both Cornell and at Princeton. And I'd be happy to take questions if there's time. So the question is about having multiple controllers. This is a, fa a fantastic question because I think being able to have multiple distributed controllers is key to making uh, software-defined network scale and be more reliable. And I think it's a it's a big open question how to do that. I agree. Supporting the switches is certainly one one direction to go. One hope we have is that some of these higher-level programming language abstractions will be easier for us to reason about what kind of work can be safely partitioned. A good example is our consistent updates abstraction. There's a lot of work that can be done concurrently to update the interior of the network that can easily be split across multiple controller replicas that are each managing a subset of the network. So I think the vote's still out on exactly how to solve the problem you mentioned, but I think that's the, that's the elephant in the room. How do you make this logically centralized controller truly distributed? Thank you.